get started because we've got lots of information to share with you today. Um, welcome. My name is Monica Hutt. I'm the Chief Prevention Officer for the State of Vermont, and I sit in the Governor's Office and also act as the liaison to the Agency of Human Services, who is who you're going to be hearing from today to talk a little bit about health care. So, yes, Representative. Oh. I'm always very reluctant to do this. Is that better? Okay, great. So today we're gonna set the table for you and talk a little bit about healthcare, talk a little bit about what we mean when we use that phrase, the scope of the healthcare system here in Vermont, some of the challenges that we're seeing and some of the ways that we're already working to address those challenges. As most of you have heard, um, you've been through uh, some of these already, this is a, a briefing that is designed for legislators. So we will pause often to make sure you can ask questions. If you have questions and it's not a pausing moment, just raise your hand and we will make sure that we stop. We wanna make sure you get the information that you need to feel grounded and confident when we're talking about healthcare and when you're talking about healthcare in the state house. Um, for those of you that are stakeholders or media if you have questions, we're happy to follow up with you um, offline or afterwards, um, but we're going to focus on our legislative um, folks for here for today. Also, I want to remind folks that we did have one of these briefings um, on community development that was scheduled or had to be rescheduled, and that will be happening next week. So we hope that you'll come back and continue this kind of ground setting, level setting um, process that you've been doing with us for the last two weeks, actually. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to get us started. We've got lots to cover. We also do have a group coming in at 5.30, so we'll try to make sure we're wrapping up right around 5 o'clock and leave a few moments for any lingering questions or catching people in the halls. But I am going to go ahead and introduce, and by the way, if you don't have a handout let me know and we'll make sure we get one to you there should be some in the back but I want to make sure you can follow along and then I'm gonna hand this over to secretary Jenny Samuelson of the Agency of Human Services she's gonna introduce her team and then we're gonna get started good evening everyone I'm excited to see you here it is so exciting to be back in person um, with the legislature in session. So thank you for coming. Um, as Monica said, we're going to go through and we're gonna start in a very basic level. And for those of you who, have, who are familiar at all with the healthcare system, just bear with us um, as we move through it. Before I get started, I wanna introduce some of my team who are here today. I'm gonna to be presenting their work and I wanna acknowledge that um, right up front and the work that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to Commissioner Haas, who is the Commissioner of the Department for Mental Health, I also have Deputy Secretary Delaws, who's here. Um, I have the, the Director of um, Healthcare Reform, Ina Backus. Um, also the Director of Payment Reform, um, from the Department for Vermont Health Access, Pat Jones, and um, Shayla Livingston, who you see often in the legislature. And if you have any follow-up questions, Shayla is probably a great contact, and she can help make sure that it gets to where it needs to go. I'm just going to check out the technology here. There we go. Where do we need to aim this to get? There you go. Okay. So just to ground um, folks, the and I'm getting a little older, so to, in order to be able to read and to be able to see you, I'm gonna swap my glasses back and forth, so patience there. Just to ground everyone, 97% of Vermonters are currently covered by health insurance. And this is really important um, and an, an important statistic because it, health insurance allows Vermonters to financially access health care. And it's different than most other states across the country. We are tied or very close to tied with Massachusetts um, for having the highest coverage rate across the country but on average what you will see is that it's much closer to 10% um, um, in other states and so that sets Vermont apart in terms of how um, Vermonters uh, can access health care. It's also important to recognize that that health care is distributed across both public insurers, so Medicaid, which covers uh, Vermonters who um, are low income, 
um, often children in Vermont and some Vermonters who have disabilities and Medicare, um, in, which covers, which is a federal program. The Medicaid is administered by the state and about 50% of those funds come from the federal government. And Medicare is covered by the federal government and administered by the federal government for individuals who are older Americans. And so the other 50% of Vermonters are covered by commercial insurance here in Vermont. And for, but for commercial insurance, they typically get it either on their own or they get it through um, their work or their business. And so that's, that is, that's an important component. The other reason that we focus on healthcare in Vermont is that it makes up a significant proportion of our gross state product, um, almost 19% and, and, and growing um, for over $6 billion. And I should have grounded us as we're talking about the healthcare system in this, in this case, we could be very broad and we could talk everything from from the very um, specifics of primary prevention, so things that happen in our communities to keep people healthy, all the way up through hospital care. But in this case, we're really talking specifically this evening about the, about the system that provides care to Vermonters across um, mental health, primary care, um, home health services, or services that are provide medical services that are provided in your home, um, also, uh, skilled nursing care, and a myriad of other, other pieces that make up that six billion, but it is confined to that care spectrum um, there. From, and it does include prevention, but it also goes all the way up through the hospital level of care. So as we think about um, our healthcare system in Vermont, it is unique in the fact that it is geographically dispersed. And by, by that, what I mean is, is that we have healthcare providers that are assigned to geographic areas and provide care in those areas. When you go down to Boston or you go to New York, within a block, you may see two or three different hospitals. That's not the way our healthcare system is set up in Vermont. And it, and it means that it's a non-competing healthcare system, which is really important. And for the majority of that system, it is nonprofit organizations. It's also, other than a few exceptions, for example, what Commissioner Haas will present in mental health, it is also delivered by community providers, not delivered by the state. And that, that's an important distinction. When we think about it, and tonight, and I'll explain why, we're going to focus in on a couple of key areas. But to give you an example of what we mean by that geographic distribution, we have 14 hospitals in the state of Vermont, geographically dispersed. We have mental health and substance use providers, so 10 community mental health centers and um, nine sub, um, preferred um, substance use providers across the state. They are geographically distributed. We also have health, home health providers. They are also designated geographically minus one, which is statewide, um, to serve an area of the state. And then we have a, uh, about 165 primary care practices that are equally distributed um, around the state. So that just gives you kind of a landscape. And that landscape, um, that landscape is important because it creates some distinctions in our healthcare system that you don't see in others. So tonight, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about the impacts of the pandemic and why we're going to focus in on four key areas. Essentially, the pandemic reinforced for us that there are parts of our healthcare system that interact with each other and that when those parts of our healthcare, one of those parts of the healthcare system doesn't work um, or is strained or stressed, we see people get care at the highest level of care in our hospitals, in our mental health hospitals. So not getting care in their communities, in their homes, in places where they would prefer to get their care but um, but really in places where they may not be getting um, the care that they want or need at that moment. Um, and so when we look at that as we go forward, the pandemic has also made certain components of our system very brittle. They are strained right now, um, and we'll talk a little bit about why, but there's a, um, the inflationary costs and staffing pressures are very acute in our healthcare system. Um, specifically, travel, you'll hear a lot about traveling nurses and them pushing the budgets over where a nurse might be 
normally $50, $75 an hour. Um, traveling nurses are two, can be as much as two or $300 an hour. So um, the workforce stress and strain of it, not having people, but also the cost is there and apparent. And so you'll see that in these four systems, our primary care system, when it's not working well, folks back up in the hospitals, our mental health and substance use system, our skilled care, and I want to say what's more specifically what I mean by that. When I talk about skilled care, that really breaks down um, in many different directions. But for tonight, we're really going to be talking about skilled nursing and home health services. And then also, as we mentioned, our hospitals. So the reason um, that, and I want to make sure folks understand this, that we are focusing in on these areas is that during the pandemic, we were acutely looking at what are the impacts to our overall health of our population and what are, um, and also what are the impacts to our healthcare system. You might remember the mantra being trying to make sure that we don't overwhelm our healthcare system. And so there's a few key data points. And in this case, if there are questions on them, I'm going to turn them over to Todd, um, who has been um, monitoring and managing a lot of our um, response to the pandemic. Um, but we can go to the next slide up on the screen. Um, essentially, from our health outcomes, there are two alarming features that, that we're seeing. The first is an increase in the number of people who are dying from drug overdoses, um, which has increased um, during the pandemic. And the second is really the number of people and the trend that we're seeing in deaths from suicide. So really demonstrating um, a, an acute need that we have for mental health and substance use um, treatment. Um, in addition to that, when we look at our healthcare system, and before the next one, go, the next slide goes up, I want to say I don't expect you to be able to read this one, um, which I. Um, but really, I want to assure folks that we are looking um, in this in the area of our hospitals at what our hospital capacity is, and um, on a daily, sometimes or several times a week basis. We have a report that comes out from the hospitals that tells us what their capacity is. And it's the color coding is probably the most important here, whether it's green, yellow, red, similar to a stoplight, black. Is, um, it tells us whether our hospitals have um, the capacity to bring patients in and deliver the care that they need. And in this chart, what you see is, is that we monitor the number of individuals who um, have acute needs that, um, that can't get in. We monitor those who um, no longer need a hospital level of care and could be transitioned to home health or to, um, or to uh, a mental health um, treatment or to community-based treatment. And so this gives us a sense of what might be putting pressure on our hospitals. Um, and, and this report we see regularly. So on the next slide, we monitor the number of available and open beds. And during the pandemic, this has gone up and down. And there are times when we've had four ICU beds open. Um, and that has, if you recall during the pandemic, has drawn significant concern. That's one car crash away from a hospital being able to triage and treat people. The second are the availability of our medical surgical beds or our normal hospital beds um, and the capacity for our hospitals to treat. Um, to treat and see that. And you can see that that throughout the arc of the pandemic, um, there are times when we've had as you know more than 62 um, acute, uh, hospital beds available. And then in the last couple of weeks, that's dipped down to 15 or even down to um, four um, ICU beds. And so we are not out of the woods yet, is what this demonstrates and shows. And the question is why? Um, and really what we see in talking with our hospitals and our system is that individuals who um, have been hospitalized and need to be and are ready to be discharged either to their home or to rehab in a skilled, skilled nursing facility or for long-term care in a skilled nursing facility, that they are staying in beds longer and in the hospital, which means the hospital cannot bring more folks into their med to their regular hospital beds. I want to say that a couple weeks ago we were excited because we finally got down to less than 112 people waiting for a hospital um, uh, placement outside of the hospital. But over the last couple of weeks, we've seen that surge again. And so that shows an alarming trend of that going up and down based on what's happening um, related to both admissions to the hospital and what's happening in our long-term care and home health facilities and the strain on those systems. And then 
lastly, one of the other areas that we look at is how many individuals and how long are they waiting for mental health placements. And again, on this slide, what you see is that that goes up and down. And green are individuals. Th this is the total number of people who are hospitalized that we monitor and watch. And green are individuals who were there. Um, the yellow are those folks who um, have been there for a, a little bit longer for placement. And the, and the red are those who've waited for a really have ac acute and complex needs and are waiting. And so we've, we've made giant strides um, in this area from where we were earlier this year, but we still see some strain in the system there. And so um, uh, Commissioner Haas will talk a little bit about that. So what this demonstrates is that if we're not treating individuals in our mental health and substance use, and many people, I'm sorry, I should have said this from the beginning, often often think of substance use as addiction. That can be somewhat offensive to individuals receiving treatment. So that's, if, if folks were confused about what that, that is, that's what it is, it's addiction, it's treatment, it has formally been called addictions treatment. So if our community mental health system's not working, our primary care system's not able to catch people earlier, um, our home health systems downstream are not able to move people out of the hospital or keep people from going to the hospital. What we see is significant strain on our hospital systems, and that is financial strain because that is the most expensive place for us to actually deliver care. So we're going to ground our, that's kind of an overview of the healthcare system and some of the main strains that they're experiencing right now, and I want to pause there to see if there are any questions about both what our system is and why we're going to focus tonight's discussion um, on a couple of key areas. Any questions? Any comments? This will be a lot more fun for everybody. No? Okay, well, then we'll keep going. Again, the, the, the four key areas that we've talked about um, are on the next slide. It's important for us to understand some of the pressures that our systems are experiencing. So the question is, why do we have people backing up in the system? Um, the pressures are, are very similar to many of our other sectors. And I want to acknowledge that the pressures that we have outside of healthcare impact healthcare and vice versa. Um, so when we look at um, our healthcare environment workforce, so it's it's the number of employees because of the the, geo, the demographic trend and shift. They've a lot, many of our nurses and other and other folks have retired. Um, it's career pathways, so getting folks in. Um, and Ina would probably could spend three hours talking about even more. It's also housing and many recruiting people to the state of Vermont and then them not being able to come because there's not enough housing for them when, when they um, land here. It's all some of the other pressures that they're experiencing are the demographics of Vermont. People are older and getting older and, they, and as they age, they, they aren't individually getting sicker, but our population is seeing more um, chronic, dis chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension um, so, or also um, high blood pressure. So we're, we're seeing more of that in, in our system and they're living longer. So um, when we talk about the skilled, care, the skilled um, nursing facilities, it's not just folks who've broken their hip, but now it's individuals um, who have uh, mental health concerns who might not normally have made it to that point in their lives who need um, support and treatment. Individuals with dementia who might have behaviors that make it difficult to care for in a normal, um, in, a, in a usual, it's not normal, but in a usual staffing model for long-term care. Um, and then the last is alignment among our health insurers, and that will be a, um, a key, in addition to those um, stabilizing those key systems of care, it will be um, in, incumbent on us to make sure that there's alignment. And I want to pause, because one of the things I didn't say is that right now in healthcare, we're trying to go down two lanes. One is coming out of the pandemic, the stability of the organizations is fraught. Financially, for the first time, we've got home health agencies, as an example, who are reporting losses. The majority of our hospitals reported financial losses last year. Our skilled nursing facilities are closing. 
because of these pressures. They don't have enough staff. Um, and when they do have enough staff, it's too expensive. So we're working on stabilizing the healthcare system. And, and, and that will be a key theme as we go forward. And we're looking at sust, uh, trying to create a sustainable future, recognizing that the demographics of Vermont have changed and that the way that we deliver care has also, need, has also changed um, over the last couple of decades. And so again, stabilization and sustainability as we go forward. Thank you. Finally, a question. That's a great question. I will say that we're working with our healthcare providers to pull together that data. Um, in some of our public safety work, they have they can see some instances of that in the public safety data, but it's really masked as you know if someone created a violent crime, and we can't tease it out of hospitals. And so we're needing to get that data from the healthcare system itself. So we're working on it, but it is a, but it is a, a tr an issue that is prominent, particularly in our emergency um, departments. Um, when, when we think about it, one of the things to contemplate is, is that our emergency departments are front line. They're front, they, and we have worked so hard in Vermont to work to make sure that individuals get a fair and true assessment and to determine whether it's a medical issue, a mental health issue, a substance use issue, before we incarcerate them. And so oftentimes they're brought to the emergency departments um, to get those types of assessments done. And in that process, um, so sometimes, and it's not just because of the, the medical, mental health or substance use issues, individuals continue to perpetuate violent ac activities. And so we're working with our, with our emergency departments to look at how we can relieve that um, over time, including, you know, is there another place where we can do those types of assessments? Um, we do them right now for individuals who are intoxicated, as an example, in our public inebriate programs. Can we do that for mental health um, outside of that? And that then gives a path that if it is someone who's violent they, and not violent for a mental health, substance use, or other issue, they can go um, and move on through their criminal justice system. So it's a great question. And it is a re one of the reasons that we do have some of our healthcare providers say that they have decided to leave the work. Um, so when we get to the mental health component of what we're talking about, think about our emergency rooms as an extension of our crisis system of care. Um, and, and that's, I think, going to be an important component. Looks like. Let me check in with our data folks and get get back to you. And um, looks like Shayla stepped out for a second, but one of us will. Ah, oh, there you are. Yeah. Shayla will get got it, and and we'll get back to you. So it is a good question, and I'm I'm glad to have you press on it because it's a it's an important issue. Okay. Okay. So at this point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it, it's a great segue to turn it over to Commissioner Haas, um, who's the commissioner with the Department of Mental Health, that will, and she will focus on some of the work that we're doing in mental health. Um, I, I do want to say up front that when we're talking about uh, mental health, the Agency of Human Services this year is really has really worked with the Department of Mental Health and our other departments to re assess what Vermonters' mental health needs are, to identify in our system of care where there are gaps, and to begin to look at making um, targeted um, strategies for those gaps. And Commissioner House will talk about those. And that, it, that's, our real, uh, that's an approach to make sure that we're not just pouring in 
money or funding into one type of organization, but that we really truly understand how we can make a shift or a turn for Vermonters. Um, and so you'll th see things like mobile crisis, and I'm gonna, I don't wanna steal um, Commissioner Haas's thunder, but mobile crisis, and you'll see alternatives to emergency departments. And so again, our goal in our mental health investments is to look at the, the service needs and to make those types of investments, um, and that should be apparent. Hi, thank you. Um, like Jenny said, Emily Haas, uh, the commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. Um, I've had an opportunity to talk through the next couple of slides through many folks in here, so it's nice to see you all here. So maybe you'll have different questions um, from the first time uh, that you saw this. Um, so this um, is essentially our system of mental health care here in Vermont. And so as you'll see, our bottom, our, our strongest uh, section of this system is our community resources. Um, and if you can see that bottom line, um, I cannot. Um, so that tells me I need to go to the eye doctor because this is a pretty big screen. Um, those are the individuals uh, providing um, services throughout our community mental health uh, system. Um, so those are um, folks who are delivering um, case management services to youth and adults. This is folks being served in schools. Uh, additionally, these are individuals who may be getting services in uh, residential homes or group homes, um, depending on the particular part of the state. Um, it's also a host of private outpatient providers. They also play an important role to our um, healthcare system. Um, so that is our, our bottom building block there. Uh, the next step up, if you think about this as levels of care, that's also your least restrictive level of care. So you move up one more uh, level, and those are our crisis supports and response. Um, so each uh, part of our state has uh, crisis beds. Uh, those came out of Act 79, if folks remember that. Uh, so each uh, community mental health agency serves adults in crisis beds. We also have youth crisis beds um, down in our Bennington area and then also in the um, um, northern parts of our states in Chittenden County. Um, if you move up another level, those are uh, what we refer to as intensive residential programs. Uh, so we offer intensive residential program throughout the state uh, for uh, adults primarily. Um, and those are uh, located, like I said, for example, in Westford or in Williamstown or down south in the Springfield area. Um, and so we offer numerous beds across that particular level of care. If you think about the next highest, um, we offer uh, services within a secure residential um, system. Right now, the state of Vermont and Department of Mental Health operate the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence. Um, and that is a uh, secure residence in Middlesex. It's currently a seven bed uh, residence. And then we will be expanding that to a 16 bed residence um, and moving that to Essex. The name change for that will be the River Valley Therapeutic Residence. And so that is for folks who are um, perhaps stepping out of the hospital, who still need um, a highly structured uh, environment to receive care before they step down through the um, other levels of care down to the least restrictive. Um, then you'll see at the top, um, like Secretary Samuelson summarized, this is also our most expensive. Um, and these are our inpatient beds. And so um, for youth, all of our inpatient beds are currently located at the Brattleboro Retreat. Uh, they serve um, youth as young as uh, four or five, up to 18. Um, they also have a transitional age uh, unit where folks who may be 18 to 25, um, they're able to be cohorted as a group on one unit there. Um, and then they also offer uh, beds for our highest acuity folks. And so when I say acuity in this context, I'm referring to individuals who uh, meet hospital level of care, but also may require additional services in order for them to have um, their treatment needs met. Uh, so Brattleboro Retreat, like I said, is uh, primarily serving, well, is serving all of our youth and then um, some adults. We also have adult beds at Rutland. 
uh, regional medical center. They also have beds that are um, high acuity beds or historical language refers to those as level one beds. Um, and then we also have Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, which is a 25 bed facility located here in Berlin. That's a state run facility for adults who are under the care and custody of the commissioner, meaning that they are involuntary. Um, right next door, Central Vermont Medical Center offers, I believe, 16 beds for adults. Uh, the UVM Medical Center um, in Burlington has two units, um, one for um, those folks who may need short-term stays, two to seven days, and then another unit for uh, targeted towards folks who might require just a little bit longer, um, but maybe not needing the additional resources like, say, um, a Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital or one of the other level one units. So this is our uh, system, uh, system snapshot. Um, I'll also mention that um, our system um, is a co-occurring system. Uh, so folks uh, who are receiving care throughout these different levels are also um, pro being provided opportunities to get treatment for any substance use disorder they may be having. If they need specialty substance use care, they're being referred for those, those services um, and uh, we really try to treat the whole person. The DMH perspective and desire is for folks to be able to get uh, services when and where they want and need those services. Um, and so while we developed this pyramid, we also identified some gaps in our system. Um, thank you. It's like you read my mind. Um, and we identify or, or define our system as four pieces to the pie. So we have uh, someone to prevent, someone to call, someone to respond, and then somewhere to go. And if you think about someone interacting with really any healthcare um, entity, but specifically for mental health care, um, when we think about someone to prevent, those are initiatives such as um, hub and spoke in expansion, um, blueprint, um, ad addressing co-occurring disorders within our primary care setting, um, and then someone to call. Um, I think folks should be aware of 988. Uh, we've done, uh, which is the national crisis line. You now have to use those 10 numbers to call somebody in Vermont, and that's because of the 988 line. Uh, so folks um, of any age um, who are in a self-defined crisis or, or also aware of somebody else who might be in a crisis can call that 988 suicide and crisis prevention lifeline. Uh, those are answered by Vermonters about 90% of the time, um, and they can get you uh, to the help that you need. Um, and also work with you in that moment or work with an individual in that moment to help um, either de-escalate a potential situation and then connect with services. Uh, so that crisis line is um, what we're really um, trying to get out to that number so that folks do call that uh, because the next step is that you can get a referral or a handoff to a treatment provider should you want to do that. Many folks call that and that's enough and they do not wish to be handed off uh, to another treatment provider. Um, so someone to respond, a priority for um, us um, over the past couple of years has been to expand mobile crisis response and that is meeting individuals in the community um, where they are, a two-person team, 24-7, um, in order to help meet folks before they feel like they need to go to an emergency room. Additionally, uh, somewhere to go, we've talked a lot about um, psychiatric urgent care and testimony. The Department of Mental Health just closed on an RFP uh, for alternatives to emergency departments, and there were um, certainly um, opportunities in there for um, parts of the state to develop a psychiatric urgent care. What that means is that instead, if folks um, would like to get services outside of an ED, uh, they can access crisis services through um, an alternative to an emergency department, like a psychiatric urgent care. Um, so we know that there will always likely be some instance where somebody may need to go to an emergency room for an assessment, typically because they're presenting with some other medical issue, and so that would certainly still be available. But for those folks who don't need that level, we want to be able to serve them in a more appropriate way. Um, 
I think that, oh, I have one more slide. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so when I was talking about our um, system, I mentioned uh, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. Uh, like I said, that's a state-run facility, um, and it is for individuals, adults, who are involuntary, uh, so under the care and custody of the commissioner. Um, we've done great work to get beds uh, back online there. They also experienced a workforce crisis and a staffing shortage, just like most of um, the healthcare system. Uh, but they are currently back up to 21 of 25 beds. We've also focused on stabilizing the Rattleboro Retreat. The Rattleboro Retreat is getting ready to be back up to pre-pandemic um, levels of being able to accept patients throughout their facility. And um, kudos to the Rattleboro Retreat team and their collaboration with um, the state and working together to form that strong um, collaboration and getting those beds back online. Um, and then the last, like I mentioned, was expanding our uh, secure residential, moving uh, the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence to Essex and expanding that to 16 beds. Um, and that also is adults. I feel like I dumped a lot of information on you and so I apologize. Um, any questions or comments at this point? I don't know the details of what uh, the juvenile facility is currently okay, proposed at. Can I, can I ask clarification? Oh, are inpatient. You, are you talking about the inpatient in southern <clears throat> Vermont? Yes, I am. Okay, that makes more sense to me. <laughs> um, sure. So um, early, last fall or last spring, the Department of Mental Health uh, put out an RFP uh, for youth inpatient. Um, and those um, youth inpatient beds were to meet a few needs of our system. One, we were experiencing an increase in youth um, with complex medical conditions who needed access to inpatient psychiatric care. Um, and folks oftentimes don't necessarily understand the limits of a standalone psychiatric facility and that they don't have a code team, so to speak, that can respond to medical emergencies um, like a medical facility would. Um, and so we saw youth uh, wait longer um, and sometimes be served on an adult unit, and that's uh, not something that we want to see happen again. Um, and so knowing that we have youth hitting our system who are also maybe pregnant, um, who may have um, untreated diabetes or severe um, uh, eating disorder, uh, those folks can um, be challenged in um, finding the appropriate placement due to the medical needs that they uh, require. Uh, so the RFP is to help serve those folks um, so that they're not waiting longer um, and then getting served in an inappropriate setting like an adult unit. Uh, we had one bid to that RFP. We um, reposted it after that um, initial bid pulled back from that project. Um, and Southwestern Vermont Medical Center was uh, the next, um, per, next facility to, to bid on the RFP. I'll highlight that that's still in a feasibility study stage, uh, so there's still more information to be learned, including how many beds, which I know um, is a, a key focus. Um, should it only be six or should it be 12? And there's a lot of different um, complexities to how many beds. That's driven by need. It's also driven by uh, staff numbers, also driven by uh, a caseload for a psychiatrist. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into uh, what a bed number is. Uh, that feasibility study should be complete by the end of uh, this coming March, and that will help us pave the way to uh, either continue with Southwestern Vermont Medical Center or re-put it out to bid. Our goal is to increase access as soon as possible uh, to youth who need hospital level of care. You're welcome. Daisy, did you? I found the answer is in the document. Gosh, okay, two wins with that. Sure. Sure. Christy Morris, uh, Representative Springfield for Vermont Springfield. Uh, previous slides have shown uh, the number of ICU beds and the number of inpatient care beds and, and uh, what the uh, availability is uh, from various months over the past, past year. Do we have data available for the number of mental health beds that are available? Um, I think you're all, you're all aware 
Sure, and we monitor that almost on a minute-by-minute -minute basis because um, folks can come in and come out of a bed multiple times in our system throughout the day. So we do provide and have uh, data. There's a, a bed board that our emergency departments can check to see where open beds are. Uh, that bed board shows availability for youth. It shows availability for adults, also crisis bed availability and intensive residential availability. Um, so we're looking to expand that um, so that there's more resources for folks to access from that one um, particular uh, website. Um, but we do have to uh, keep track of that. I will say, you know, in general, and I, I would imagine this is li likely the same for, for med surge or ICU, is, is, is a bed is not a bed is, is not a bed. Um, so it could depend on if that's a shared room and the person in the other bed is... Uh, may not it may not be a good match for whoever is looking for admission. So there are some admission decisions that go into that. Um, we do have numerous beds uh, closed throughout the system, and that shifts every day based on staffing availability, acuity, um, a number of things. Um, but I'd say in general, uh, more beds are open than closed, um, and there are typically people waiting, and there are open beds available. Uh, but like I said, that shifts um, on a daily basis, uh, but that's the Department of Mental Health has a team of care managers who help triage folks in and out of emergency rooms in collaboration with all of our inpatient units and um, community mental health providers uh, so that folks um, are not waiting longer than, than necessary. mentioned in your question was EMS, so emergency medical services, being able to access those beds. And so, Commissioner Haas, I wonder if you can explain the pathway, that it's not, it's not as simple as, um, you know, um, mental health um, hospitals don't have an emergency department specifically for mental health. And so uh, EMS can't bring someone who's in mental health crisis straight to a hospital. So do you want to talk a little bit about what that pathway looks like? Sure, I can do that if that's helpful for your question. Um, so let's, I'll use a couple of examples. I'll start with a voluntary example. Um, somebody can call, say, um, the Brattleboro Retreat and do an intake assessment and can be admitted from their home. They don't necessarily need to go through an emergency room. Um, if a primary care provider has labs or something like that, they can send that over and um, they'll take a look at the medical stability along with the psychiatric needs for that individual. That person can go um, in however transport they want to get to that facility. Um, we also have folks who are in an emergency room waiting for placement. They've been screened, uh, likely by um, a community mental health um, emergency services screener um, to determine if they A, meet hospital level of care, or B, will go voluntary or not voluntary. Um, an ambulance provider, EMS, can transport somebody from an ED who's voluntary or not voluntary. Um, depending on um, an assessment of safe transport. Um, and so then that transport would occur, let's say, down to the retreat or down to CVMC or Rutland, depending on um, where the admitting facility is. Um, we also have youth who end up in the emergency room. They're screened, and then they are um, determined that it's safe for that individual to wait from home um, with a safety plan, responsible adult. Uh, that individual will then wait from home uh, for access to that inpatient bed so that they uh, don't have to spend prolonged periods of time in an emergency setting that can be quite chaotic and often uh, quite triggering for individuals. Um, did that answer your question? It, it does. I, I just, uh, I'm also a member of the EMS Squad. Yeah, I thought so. I remember. <laughs> spend a lot of time on <laughs> mental health and so Commissioner Haas is going to stay but I um, but I want to make sure that we um, that we also 
get a chance to touch on some of the other areas. These we're gonna breeze through relatively quickly, but I want, um, my goal is to ensure that folks have an idea of some of the things um, that you may see come in legislation or come up um, during the session related to, um, related to what, what's happening and going on. Okay, so when we think about um, primary care, um, it's important for us to know that Vermont has a strong foundation of primary care. That includes our federally qualified health centers, um, independent primary care, which are pri or practices are owned by physicians, and then hospital-owned primary care. Um, we need to continue, as you heard, some of our challenges in mental health and substance use have increased um, during th throughout the pandemic. We'd seen a, they were coming down. The pandemic has made them go up. Um, it really has identified an opportunity and a challenge for us to meet and to evolve into as we go forward because primary care can be foundational. The uh, significant number of individuals who commit suicide um, and are successful, who take acts of violence against themselves and are successful, actually saw their primary care provider um, in a very short time period before they did that. Um, quick question. How do we bridge that gap? So I can see Ina kind of at the edge of her seat a little bit on this question. Um, and there are some policies that are already in place that allow access to primary care with lower copays and other pieces. And I don't know, Ina, if you want to speak to that before I bridge that gap. <laughs> in addition to that statistic that you shared about those Vermonters uh, who are who are categorized as uninsured, uh, I think it's also important to talk about the results from our household health insurance survey um, from the most recent year. And that survey has some information in it. Um, that demonstrates, at least at the point of that survey, uh, that Vermonters um, were accessing care and were accessing care in ways that were uh, more frequent than in historical surveys, and also that Vermonters' debt due to health care uh, costs and, um, and service utilization uh, was not um, that that debt load for Vermonters had in fact improved over a period of time. So you think that's a place to uh, really look at a number of data points together to better understand um, what's, what people are experiencing relative to their particular coverage. It is the case that people are categorized in that um, under-insured category, uh, but we also know that many Vermonters have um, health savings or health resources resource uh, accounts that their uh, that their uh, employer have offered, and that they are utilizing those resources to help with these copays and deductibles when they can, and that those are paired with what looks like in a survey like a lesser coverage or a um, underinsured model. So 
Oftentimes, your what we'll hear from our constituents is that, um, and these are true. These are true uh, issues for us to tackle, is that people are having problems accessing a primary care provider um, for two reasons. One. Um, there's a lot of practices who aren't accepting new patients, and so if you're new to Vermont and you don't have a primary care provider, it's hard to find one. And the second, for some practices, because of workforce shortages and others, um, when they call their primary care provider, they're having a hard time getting in within the time frame that they want to get into. And so some of that information and the data um, on that is in both an access study that was done between the Agency of Human Services, Green Mountain Care Board, and um, and the Department for Financial Regulation. It's also in the Household Health Survey. The second piece is coordinating care um, with other providers. Um, we see that uh, when people do need care outside of primary care, we see it as a critical function for that to be coordinated. Um, preventing and managing chronic conditions, so making sure that you get your, if you have diabetes, that you get your blood work done. Um, and then also addressing mental health and substance use. And in this area, it's by identifying and addressing the pressures that people are feeling in their lives. And you'll hear that as often screening for mental health and substance use, but also the term social determinants of health. So. What about housing insecurity, food insecurity, violence that's happening in the home? We know that all of those things are impacted, uh, impact an individual's mental health and well-being. Um, and so in the near term, what you'll see us working towards is really making investments in primary care to integrate that mental health and substance use and that screening for those um, health-related risk factors. Um, and so that that will, um, <clears throat> we're working, and that comes out of the Mental Health Integration Council with primary care as a key focus. How can we get more staffing into those practices that are skilled at doing that? Um, I'm going to move on quickly into skilled care. Again, that's home health and um, skilled nursing facility care. Um, and I want to recognize the demographic trend here and the need to evaluate what's necessary at a local, regional, and a statewide level. What we see is as individuals are getting older, um, over the last few over the last few decades, that there's been regulatory pressures to to make sure to keep in check the number, for example, of skilled nursing facilities because people were being um, warehoused is what I've heard people talk about in the past or put into a level of care that they didn't want and that they didn't necessarily need. And so th there's been a lot of effort to right size that. But as we see the demographic trend, um, uh, that's putting pressure up on that. And then financial workforce pressures and demographic issues we've talked about. So in the short term right now, we are, we are working to evaluate the financial viability of home health and skilled nursing facilities and look at how we can address that. We're evaluating um, the Choices for Care program, which I'm just going to describe what it is, but it's a way to get services in your home, um, home make services that have someone help you with things that you can't normally do that would make it so that you would need a nursing home level of care, but that you might not be eligible for under normal Medicaid. It allows us to provide those services so that you're able to stay in your home and not go to a skilled nursing facility. So evaluating how that program exists and its funding investing funds in opening nursing home beds right now due to staffing, so trying to cover the difference in the staffing costs. So that as you saw, those pressures go up, um, working with some of the facilities to open closed beds um, by covering some of those costs. And that's a very short term. It's not something we can do forever, but it's something that's critical for us to do right now. Um, as we try to figure out the financial sustainability long term, that's just the stability. And then opening specialized beds. As I mentioned before, individuals who are aging who have mental health, substance use issues, who have violent behaviors because of dementia or others, and our skilled nursing facilities aren't aren't rightly positioned now to provide care. And that's what a lot of the folks who are in our hospitals right now waiting for a bed are waiting because it's not that there aren't open beds, but there isn't the right bed, um, as Commissioner Haas talked about. And then lastly, um, Commissioner Haas mentioned that we've been working with the Brattleboro Retreat. We dug in deep with them. We looked at what, finan what and I'm going to use them as an example up front. We dug in deep with them to really identify what it was that the care needs of Vermonters were, where they were losing money, and in those places where they were losing money that we didn't necessarily need them to do provide that care, they discontinued it. Um, they did, not the state. And then in those places where they were underfunded, we provided supplemental funding. 
And as we look at our hospital system and the sustainability going forward, there is a need to do that on a broader scale to identify what we need at the local, regional, and statewide level for our hospital levels of care and to engage in that in a collaborative process with, with our hospitals around the state. Um, because they've experienced regulatory pressures over the last couple, few years to really control costs, coupled with the pandemic, they're in a very different financial position than we've seen before. They are brittle, they are losing money, and it's been important for us to really work to stabilize them as well as the other parts of our system. We're not going to efficiency our way out of uh, our healthcare cost problem anymore. Um, and so recognizing the role that our hospitals play in our local economies, they really are foundational in the health of our communities, which draws new people in, and they are a, an economic driver in our local communities. It's important for us to look at how we stabilize them. So we're working with the Green Mountain Care Board to evaluate, as I said, the local, regional, and statewide needs. We're doing that in collaboration with healthcare providers. Um, and we'll work on it. That'll be at the state level. But we'll work hand in hand with them to evolve um, what the future model looks like for community hospital care. And that's work that's, that's ongoing. And so I want to pause there. Any questions, I breeze through that. As Monica said, this was going to be really fast. We were going to try to take um, a multi-layered set of issues, and we were going to try to introduce them in a rapid-fire fashion just to kind of whet your appetite um, for the future. So any questions on those three areas? Representative Rebecca? Efficiency our way out of this? Yeah. That's a great question. Glad you picked up on that. So for the last few years, we have spent, and I, I'm one of the folks who really said that we need to look for efficiencies in our hospital-based system, and we do. And that we will get that we will gain enough cost savings out of that to really turn the cost curve and make critical community investments. We still need to work with our hospitals to find efficiency, but there is not enough room in that. Vermont is the lowest cost Medicare state in the country. We are not, in terms of the amount of dollars that come in, we are not going to, to be able to, to squeeze enough efficiency simply out of our hospital systems to continue to make the investments. And if we do, we are going to jeopardize the viability of hospitals. It won't just be the Brattleboro Retreat, who is on the edge of not being able to move forward, and Springfield Hospital. It will be many of our, our smaller community hospitals. So there may be investments, not just contracting, but investments that we need to make in the future. But we have to do that with hospitals, and we have to be willing to evolve. And as a follow-up, when we talk about efficiency, I feel like we are I'm glad that you brought that up. And I think um, it allows me to point to a cornerstone of what you see today, which is we spent the last five years focusing on changing the way we pay. And that's really for health care. And that's really important. Moving from paying for every time a service is delivered to paying um, in different ways that would help to give providers flexibility and incent outcomes. The agency in working with our providers has really refocused some of, uh, refocused a lot of our attention now. What does the system of care look like that we need? And you see that as we talk about um, in looking at investments in primary care with, with a specific 
um, intention in mind, mental health and substance use. You see that as we talk about the investments that the mental health system is doing. So really, what are the services that we need? You also, in proposals underneath that, um, like the blueprint as foundational to primary care, see um, a work to evaluate how we can do care differently in those practices to improve. And so um, in the past, it's been a lot about if we pay differently, care will be delivered differently. We're really fo refocusing now on how do we care differently and then use the payments to support that care. And so that is a change in, in our focus and also from just provider-driven reform to a public-private partnership because the pandemic pointed out that when the state partners closely with providers. We hear better what it is that providers need. We can resource that better. Um, and we can work collaboratively to provide the training and quality improvement supports. The Blueprint for Health, which is a program that works with primary care providers, is a perfect example of where that works really well. So thank you for that question. Go ahead, and, and if you could just say, I don't, I, with so many new and old names and two years, it's hard to remember everyone, so if you could, yeah. Thank you. That's an, that's an interesting one. I can see Monica kind of on the edge of her seat, and we're welcome to, to dig in um, on that one. So our Department for um, Aging, for Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living does have a general sense of what the beds are in the state. What you saw earlier was us really tracking availability on a day-to-day -day basis. I would have to dig in with them, and I'll get back to you, to know the degree to which they are um, monitoring that. Um, my understanding across all of these industries, what's preventing people from getting in is, in, is oftentimes as much co like reimbursement as it, as it is the workforce shortage. So it really is the fact that many of the beds that we have here um, that, that providers don't have open, it's not because they don't get paid enough. It's because, it's because there's um, simply not enough staff to, to staff them. Um, so I can dig in with, with Dale, with, uh, with our department a little bit more to get back with you with a more fulsome answer. Um, but that is generally what we're seeing in terms of people coming into the market in long-term care and leaving the market in our assisted and skilled nursing facilities is because they simply cannot get the staff. And if they can, it is so expensive um, at this point that, they, that it's not financially feasible. So. Thank you. No, so let me, for everyone else in the room, let me describe what One Care is. And then I think what you're talking about is Blue Cross Blue Shield. Is that what you're talking about? Withdrawing? Okay. It's a good guess. Yeah, no, that's okay. I'm going to move around a little bit. So, One Care in Vermont is an organization of providers who have come together and um, agree that they will manage the health of an entire population and that they will get paid in a different way. For hospitals, it's through a fixed payment versus getting paid every time they do a service um, for um, their care. And in general, it's been described as a way that providers come together and they get paid differently and that they, and that they agree that they're gonna provide care differently in order to help moderate 
cost and and quality to um, Representative Rebecco's um, point. And our goal was is that that would help with some of the quality improvement. So rec over the last five years, Vermont has been testing th this model where one care is an ACO, that type, that provider type of an organization, and they have hospitals as members and primary care as members, all the providers that we've listed. Um, and Blue Cross Blue Shield came forward and said, we have concerns um, about whether they are providing uh, um, the value that is worth the cost in the system. And it is incumbent, uh, there's, as a payer, um, the Agency of Human Services actually administers Medicaid. Um, and so as a payer um, ourselves, we are working to evaluate that question um, as we go forward. How do we want to provide care differently and pay differently to continue to get our systems to be where we where they need to be? Um, and that said, um, for us as Medicaid, um, while we try to decide that over the next couple of years, whether an ACO is or is not involved in our healthcare system in the future, it was important that we continue, given the brittleness of our system that we have right now, to not do anything that would be catastrophic um, and harm our providers. So if, if Medicare were to pull out or Medicaid were to pull out, our providers, the way that they get paid, but not only would we not get investments from Medicare that we currently get um, into our state of Vermont, um, but the way that they get paid, their operate it would create operational inefficiencies overnight. So we need time to decide what that what it is that's next, and we need to make sure that we are responsibly evolving um, to that whether an ACO is a part of that or not, so that we don't further destabilize this system. And so the Agency of Human Services has been working with Medicare to define what it will look like going forward. We've been working with Medicaid. Um, our insurers have been involved in those conversations, but it, we have real recognition that we need to pull together our insurers so that we can align on what was the last slide, really align on what the quality measures are that we should be measuring so that we how we're going to evaluate the effectiveness of programs like the ACO and how we want to pay differently going forward because that lack of alignment is causing instability in the system right now but we can't shut something down overnight or it will cause more brittleness does that answer your question mostly yeah so that we're still working to quantify, and if Ina or Pat would like to answer it, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield has said that they will continue payments to the, to the primary care providers who receive augmented payments through Blue Cross Blue Shield's participation. But uh, if we talk with the ACO and the primary care providers, they would say that for the amount that Blue Cross puts in, that money gets, additional money gets added and primary care providers may lose payment. So they may actually, it, it, it may result in um, primary care providers, which are key to the foundation of our prevention in the system, don't, don't have as much money going into the next couple of years. And that's what I mean about making a very quick decision. Um, it, you know, be us understanding what the operational consequences of that takes more than a couple of weeks to determine. And so we're still we're still working that through. Um, and we would want to make sure that we keep our, our primary care providers whole. I don't know, Ina or Pat, anything you want to add? Did I answer your question? There are consequences. I just want to make that clear. There are consequences, and the majority of that's to primary care. It's, 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 it, could go it could. And I'd be happy to stay out. I know we've got to be out of the room for another meeting, but I would be happy um, to stay after and answer more detailed questions about that. But the fact of the matter is, is that we don't, the consequences we'll, we'll have to find out as we move forward of that. And our direction for the ACO um, and, the, and where we're going in the future is, is a part of the broader healthcare discussion. Okay, any last questions? I want, I'm sure Monica is going to, to Ha help everyone kind of end the evening. But before we go, I want to say thank you for coming. Um, this is something that is a deep topic, but it affects every single 
Vermonter. Um, and so I appreciate you being willing to give us an hour this evening. And our team is always here um, to answer questions because this is multi-layered. Um, and we've just touched on four parts of a multi-part healthcare system. So thank you for coming tonight. Nothing more to add. Thank you all so much for coming. I expect we'll see many or all of you at the governor's budget address tomorrow. And just as a reminder, we rescheduled one of these briefings um, for next week. So we hope that you'll come back and hope that these continue to be valuable to you as you are getting grounded in the work that you're going to be doing this session. So thanks so much.